Our first speaker today is Jennifer L. Parisi. She is an assistant U.S. attorney with the United States Attorney's Office in the Middle District of Florida. Jennifer is passionate about protecting senior citizens from fraud, serving as a voice for victims, and ensuring that justice prevails. Jennifer has been an assistant U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Florida in the Tampa Division since 2010. She's a member of the Economic Crime Section, where she focuses on prosecuting elder fraud cases. Since 2018, she has been the district's Elder Justice Coordinator. In this role, she travels across the state, helping senior citizens learn how to protect themselves from becoming fraud victims. Prior to joining the United States Attorney's Office, Jennifer worked in a private practice at a law firm in Washington, D.C. for three years. Before that, she served as a law clerk to Judge Morris S. Arnold on the United States Courts of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, and as an adjunct professor at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock School of Law. She is a 2006 graduate of the Yale Law School. While in law school, she was an articles editor on the law, and, excuse me, on the law, on the Le Yale Law Journal. And in 2005, she received the Colby Townsend Memorial Prize for Best Paper and the Benjamin N. Cardozo Prize for Best Moot Court Brief. She graduated summa cum laude from Emory University in 2003 with Bachelor of Arts and Master's of Arts degrees in Political Science. At Emory, she received the Elliot Levitas Award for the most outstanding political science graduate and was member of the Beta, uh, excuse me, Phi Beta Kappa. She has been a big sister with the Big Brothers and Big Sisters program for eight years. AUSA Parisi, thank you for being our presenter today. And I'm going to take a moment and pull up your slides and we'll get started with your presentation. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to present today about fraud prevention with a focus on COVID-19 fraud scams. Americans lose billions and billions of dollars to financial fraud every year. In fact, it is estimated that every year over 13% of older Americans, more than one in 10, are victims of financial fraud. And to put this in context, this is not someone losing $100 or $1,000. This is seniors losing their entire life savings to fraudsters and scammers. However, only one in 44 cases of financial abuse are reported. And my job as Elder Justice Coordinator, and hopefully with your help, is to change that. Next slide, please. Can we move on to the next slide? Perfect. So I'm from the United States Attorney's Office with the Middle District of Florida. And what that means in English is basically all the way up from Jacksonville to the north, to Fort Myers in the south, Tampa, Orlando, Acala. We investigate and prosecute violations of federal criminal law. And one of our priorities, uh, one of our office priorities right now is to prosecute elder abuse and financial fraud. Next slide, please. Like I said, Americans lose lots of money every year to fraudsters. And as you can see from this slide, everyone is a potential victim. All age groups lose money to fraud, but older Americans are particularly vulnerable. Elder victims report victimization more frequently and often lose more money. We find that senior citizens with cognitive issues, for example, dementia, tend to suffer the greatest economic loss. And when we look in the research, one of the key factors in determining who becomes a victim is isolation. And this is particularly concerning in COVID-19 because we're all isolated. So we're all more vulnerable. So why do the fraudsters target senior citizens? Bottom line, they have money. There's a lot of senior citizens. Approximately 10,000 Americans turn 65 years old every day. There's a perception that senior citizens have money saved up that they can spend. And if they're retired, 
senior citizens are more likely to be at home, more likely to be accessible. We also find they're more likely to actually answer the phone when there's a number that they don't recognize. Some senior citizens are lonely and are looking forward to having someone to talk to on the phone, even if that someone turns out to be a fraudster. And some senior citizens suffer from ailments that make them particularly vulnerable to certain schemes, such as memory loss. Next slide, please. How does financial, can we go back one? I think we skipped forwards. How does financial abuse occur? Basically any way you can think of to talk to someone, the fraudsters use to catch victims. Phone, computer, mail, TV, radio, in person. In fact, with COVID-19, we had a recent, I think it was about six weeks ago, a couple in Clearwater, Florida, and someone was impersonating HHS, Health and Human Services. And they said, we're here from the government and we're here to test you for COVID. They actually convinced the elderly people to let them into their house and then forced them. At that point, the senior citizens realized they probably weren't really HHS, but they forced them to give swabs for a purported COVID-19 test. Next slide. I wanna tell you about some of the most common scams. And COVID-19 fraud is already big business. We're seeing big fraud losses. We're seeing fraudsters that are taking advantage of the circumstances. There's a captive audience, a lonely audience, a vulnerable audience that is scared by the situation we all find ourselves in. And these fraudsters are good. They're effective. They use scare tactics to threaten, harass, and frighten people, and especially the elderly, into parting with their hard-earned money. Next slide, please. So with COVID-19 in particular, we're seeing a lot of scams with individuals and businesses selling fake cures or fake tests for COVID-19 or fake or overpriced supplies. For example, right here in the Middle District of Florida, we're seeing a lot of cases with fake N95 masks. Obviously, anyone can put anything up on the internet and claim this is a legit N95 mask without it actually having that certification. Bottom line on all of this COVID-19, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Unfortunately, as we know, there's no known cure for COVID and there's no vaccine yet. But that doesn't stop people from emailing, calling, or posting online claimed cures and obviously charging a pretty penny. One case that we're investigating right now is someone who is actually advertising a pesticide as a COVID-19 cure. And he was effective and with his advertising people were buying it and people were taking it because these fraudsters are using scare tactics and they're using effective persuasion it's the same thing with fake tests and fake supplies and the newest scam we're seeing is actually people impersonating person's facebook friends so you get a message and you think it's jane smith and you're excited because Jane Smith plays bridge with you, but you haven't seen her in two months and she's sending you a Facebook message. Well, unfortunately, it's pretty easy for a fraudster to take Jane Smith's picture and to pretend to be Jane Smith. And then as Jane Smith, what we're seeing is that the fraudsters are saying that they have extra stimulus payments, that you've been selected for an extra payment not just the regular one that everyone was entitled to, but an extra one, because you have some sort of particular need or some sort of particular merit. Click on this link and send $500 for the processing. There's no money. It's a scam. And the issue is for all of these, do your research and be suspicious. Next slide, please. 
So the next thing I want to talk about is government imposter fraud. And we see this all the time pre-COVID, but especially now with COVID. A scammer claims to be with a government agency and threatens a victim with arrest or a fine or ask for personal identifying information, such as the bank account of the victim. But it's actually a person behind a computer somewhere abroad. The fraudsters ask for payment, often via wire or gift cards, and they keep the victims on the phone until the transaction's complete. Because they don't want the victim to take enough time to think about, is this really legit? So pre-COVID, the most common thing we saw with this type of scam was someone claiming to be from the IRS and requesting back taxes or someone claiming to be with the marshals or local law enforcement and saying there's a warrant out for your arrest. Well, we all know if law enforcement has a warrant, they're gonna come to the person's door. They're not gonna call the person up and they're certainly not going to ask for payment in iTunes gift cards to avoid being arrested on that warrant. But when we get stressed, when we don't have time to think about it, when we're pressured, if we're an elderly person with some memory issues, we might not know, and we might forget, and we might pay the fraudster that money. With COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of fraudsters who are claiming to be from Medicare, claiming to be from Social Security Administration, and telling people that their benefits are about to be suspended, and they either need to pay a fee or they need to give their social security number, their bank account number, other personal identifying information. Well, of course, social security doesn't need your social security number. They have it. The fraudsters need your social security number so they can steal your identity and so they can steal your money. Next slide, please. Next thing I wanna talk about is romance fraud. And this is where a scammer meets a victim online, befriends the victim, maybe convinces victim that he or she is boyfriend or girlfriend, and then uses this trust to trick the victim into sending money. This happens all the time. Unfortunately, any place people are looking to communicate, there are fraudsters sitting on the other end looking to take advantage. But it's particularly troubling in COVID-19 because all people, and especially seniors, are isolated. So seniors are more likely to fall for this kind of scam. Next slide, please. So just to give us a vigil, and this is literally what it is. Online, he's tall, dark, and handsome, rich, looking for love. And the reality? At best, he's Shrek on the right, and at worst, he's someone sitting behind a computer ready to take the money. These fraudsters email hundreds of women, it's usually women, um, and they send the same basic email. I'm a widow looking for love. Most women don't respond, but a few do. And these fraudsters will become a pen pal for months with their victims gain trust, and ask for money. Bottom line, don't give money to someone you haven't met in person. If you hear about a friend or a client or a colleague doing it, advise them the same. I get that it's particularly hard to meet up with people in these COVID-19 times. We're seeing these romance fraudsters saying that they need money for COVID-19 treatment which seems like a legit reason, but they're telling everyone this. And they're telling everyone this because it's the easiest way to get people, and especially seniors, to part with their hard earned money. Next slide, please. So the next type of fraud I wanna talk about, and the last most common fraud scheme we're seeing in COVID and non-COVID times, is a scammer who claims to be a computer technician, often associated with a well-known company 
or its products, for example, Microsoft. And the individual calls up seniors or others, but particularly seniors, and says that viruses or other malware have been detected on the consumer's computer. And then the scammer charges for unnecessary software services like virus removal. And while they're in, while they have access to the victim's computer, they steal personal information from that victim, like their bank account information. We're seeing a ton of tech support fraud. I think I have about 10 cases myself involving people involved in this type of fraud. And the new flavor is COVID-19 fraud. So the fraudsters are calling victims and saying, your computer has COVID-19. It might not make a lot of sense to us sitting here in a training thinking about it, but you can understand if you catch a vulnerable, scared, lonely, potentially person with health issues, that they might be susceptible to the fraudsters. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some tips for avoiding fraud. But I wanna take a moment here, and especially because I know that I'm talking to both senior citizens and also people who work with and help out senior citizens. And so you might be watching this presentation and saying, well, no way am I vulnerable to any of these types of fraud schemes. And I hope that's right, and that's awesome. But you need to help others. We all need to set up sort of a neighborhood watch for fraud. If you saw, if you were in your neighborhood and you saw your neighbor's house on fire, you wouldn't hesitate. You'd call the fire department, you'd call the police. Same thing with these fraud schemes. If your neighbor is sending thousands of dollars to someone they've never met, that they think is boyfriend because they met online, we need to look out for others. The most vulnerable people aren't attending this training right now, and they're not educated about schemes, and they don't have a network, so they need our help. So let's look out for others. In terms of avoiding fraud on your own or telling others about how to avoid fraud, be suspicious. Do your research. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And if you're not sure, inquire. If you get a phone call and it sounds like maybe it's true from the Social Security Administration, well, hang up that phone. Don't talk to the person on the other end you don't know. And call up the Social Security office and say, do you need some information from me? That's the best way to do your homework and check out what's going on. Next slide, please. So I have up here two resources, and there's a lot of them. So these are just two I want you to know about for fraud schemes and specifically COVID-19 fraud. The first is the National Center for Disaster Fraud. There's a hotline, so there's a 1-800 number, and I know Patricia's gonna write it in the chat, so I won't read it out loud right now. And there's also an online form. This is a way to report any sort of fraud or scam related to coronavirus. The second one is the Internet Crime Complaint Center, www.ic3.gov. You can report any type of internet fraud to that website. If we don't know about it, we can't do anything about it. Now, I'd like to say we will get back the victim's money, and we try. And sometimes we do, but often after the money's spent, after the money gets abroad, it's too late. But if you don't fall victim to a fraud scheme, report that too, so we know about it, so we can look out for people, and so we can help prevent other people from becoming victims. Thank you so much for your time and for your attention.
Patricia, you're muted. I want to encourage people to uh, remember to mute and unmute at the appropriate times, as I just didn't. But if we were in an in-person meeting, we might ask, who's here from Hillsborough County? Who's here from Highlands County? And since we can't really get that information any other way, drop a note in the chat box. Let us know what county you're from or what city you're from because we know we have people from all over Central Florida joining us. So if you do that, I'd appreciate it. And then we would also, um, and our speakers would like to know as well. And if you have questions based on um, Jennifer's presentation, please drop them in and we will get back to them. And as you're listening to the other speakers, if you have a question that just jumps into your mind for the previous speaker, you can put that in there as well. Our next presenter is Lynn V. Penley. She is the West Central District Ombudsman Manager for the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. Lynn is the West Central District Ombudsman Manager covering Hillsborough and Manatee counties. She has worked as an advocate for Florida's long-term care ombudsman program for 12 years. Her education includes 12 years of on-the-job training, which we all know is the best education for any job, a Bachelor of Arts degree in anthropology from the University of South Florida, and then in December 2019, she received the Graduate Certificate in Aging and Geriatric Practice from the University of Florida College of Medicine. Lynn, thank you for joining us today. And I know you have a lot of information to share with us as well as I'm sure people have questions, especially related to COVID-19. Well, thank you so much for having me today. As you said, my name is Lynn Penley and I'm the District Ombudsman Manager uh, for the West Central uh, District and that's Hillsborough and Manatee County. Someone just asked me a little while ago, you know, what that included and that includes uh, uh, just under 400 um, facilities that we go to and residents that we advocate for. So um, my goal today is really to let you know what the Ombudsman program is about and how you can reach us when you need us. So our mission at Florida's Long-Term Care Ombudsman program is to improve the quality of life for all Florida long-term care residents um, by uh, advocating for and protecting their health, safety, welfare, and rights. Um, our volunteers are trained advocates that go out to long-term care. So in Florida, that means they go out to nursing homes, assisted living, and adult family care homes. Um, we know that those residents living in long-term care are some of the most vulnerable out there. Um, they're vulnerable to abuses and uh, vulnerable or feel vulnerable to uh, retaliation if they speak up. So uh, why is that? Uh, why do they feel, why are they vulnerable? Um, just as our previous speaker said, you know, they may, may have a, uh, not be connected as they used to be. You know, they're distanced from their social support, such as family who might be out of town or out of the state. Uh, living or friends that they used to have or, you know, the community that they had uh, been living in most of their life and may have moved away from that. So they don't have those support systems to protect them. Um, also, they often have poor uh, physical health and are more dependent on others for assistance. I mean, that's why people go uh, live at long-term care. They need that assistance with things, uh, basic things such as um, you know, meals or medications or help bathing or getting to doctors. So they, um, they are very dependent on others and, and that makes them vulnerable. So what does the Ombudsman program do? Part of what we do is uh, we do annual administrative assessments at all long-term care facilities. And this is within the, uh, the uh, state of Florida. Each state has its own Ombudsman program, but I'm just gonna speak about Florida. Um, and when we're out there doing those annual assessments, uh, we're talking to residents mainly is our focus, um, asking them how, uh, how they're doing, how their care is, if they have any concerns or any complaints or need any assistance. 
Uh, we're also making general observations about care and, uh, and physical of the facility. And then we're making recommendations for improvement. And then we do follow up if there needs to be any to make sure those improvements are, uh, are completed. We also have a visitation program where we try to get out to uh, all of our residents uh, at least quarterly. And that visitation is part of that, you know, staying connected with the community. We're out there reminding residents that they can speak up if they have a concern. And we're out there letting them know that they have access to the ombudsman program and reminding them of their rights. We also do things such as this, you know, outreach uh, programs where we're educating the general public or maybe residents, their families, staff of long-term care, other healthcare professional or other agencies about what the Ombudsman program does and about resident rights. Now, what I think is one of our most effective tools is that we take complaints on behalf of residents. So our complaints, uh, we take quite a, a wide variety of complaints that we can help with. Um, but that's all, those also include abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Um, I like to think of us as very unique because we strive for resident satisfaction when we take a complaint. Uh, we're not necessarily out there to verify a rule or a law was broken. That might be for another entity to do. We're there for the resident. So we're asking them, um, what outcome do you want? And then we make that our goal. And another part of our uniqueness is our volunteer ombudsman. Um, they're a friendly face to have a conversation with. Uh, they have varied life experiences and they take their time and go out to speak with residents and be that friendly face and be that easy person to talk to uh, about concerns. And uh, they're there to ensure the residents uh, have that quality of life and can speak up. I know some people out there, you know, are a little fearful of, of someone with a badge, but when we're out there as volunteers, uh, they know that the, that person is donating their time and, and really cares and want to ha wants to have a conversation with them. Uh, so I think that's one of our um, awesome uniquenesses. So when we go out and visit with residents, uh, we're educating them on uh, their rights and how to exercise them. And one of those rights being they have the right to be free from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. They have the, the right to voice their grievances and be heard and have things improved. And they have a right to uh, access to the Ombudsman Program representatives. With that, um, with that education, we're empowering the residents to take action and encourage them to you know, self-advocate or speak up for themselves. Um, if something, if they feel something isn't right, or if they feel they're not getting the care they deserve. We're also encouraging them to connect or speak up on behalf of other residents who may not be able to speak for themselves or may not have many visitors to speak for them. Uh, and I think that's an important role for residents uh, to remember is to help others. And then of course, we're out there reminding them if there is suspicion of abuse, neglect, or exploitation to report it. Um, for us, uh, we're also reminding them to contact the Ombudsman Program when they need us or when they have a question. So um, as I said, we, um, we do outreach with educating families and friends and staff. Um, and we're reminding them that especially they need to be speaking up for those residents who might not have someone or not, might not be able to advocate or speak up on their own behalf. Uh, that silent population out there. So we remind everyone that they can contact us and um, uh, with a concern on behalf of a resident and it's confidential um, and it's free of charge. So they don't have to necessarily give us their name if they don't want to. Um, as I said before, with our complaints, uh, I, again, that's one of our most effective tools on behalf of, uh, of residents is having um, being able to take a complaint, going out and investigating and trying to get it resolved for the resident. And some of those complaints, they can be anywhere from, you know, physical abuse to uh, rough handling by staff to financial abuse or exploitation. Uh, sometimes it might be, you know, the family is no longer paying the facility, you know, leaving the, the resident vulnerable to um, eviction. Um, and it can also be things such as, you know, a lack of timely care or the resident not being treated with the dignity and respect. 
Uh, so we pretty much can take any kind of complaint that maybe another agency might not be able to. So to kind of put that all in perspective, I'd like to share a success story with you about our advocacy. Um, I received a phone call in the office uh, from a resident. I'll call him Mr. Smith. That's not really his name. Um, but he was calling because he had seen our poster uh, up in his assisted living facility and it uh, listed all of his rights and also that he could call the ombudsman program for, um, for help. So he was telling me about his experience. He lives at the assisted living with his wife and um, he was telling me that uh, staff were mean and were yelling at him and his wife and yelling at other residents. And he also said that one of the, specifically one of the supervisors on staff seemed to be the worst and was letting this happen. Um, so he had said he'd already tried things, you know, self-advocacy, uh, including speaking to the administration, but nothing seemed to, to help. And it actually felt like it was getting worse because he had spoken up, you know, and now he was the target of people, uh, of, of staff's uh, um, abusive behavior. So um, what we did was we took a complaint. Uh, he didn't want to use his name on the complaint because he felt he'd get more retaliation. So we decided to take the complaint on behalf of all the residents, since he said this was happening to multiple people. So um, we assigned one of our volunteers, uh, uh, Bill went out to the assisted living and talked to several residents about their concerns in general, you know, reminded them of their rights and that they could speak up and, and they had the right to be heard. And um, after talking to those residents, all were fearful of retaliation and didn't want to give their names. Um, he got from them, you know, things like, um, you know, residents or the staff are shouting at us or, and are rude. You know, they scold and, and um, yell at forgetful residents. They're mean. They can be verbally abusive. You know, staff seem to gang up on residents and yell at them. Uh, one was even saying that they had witnessed another resident begging for a pain medication and staff were ridiculing her for that. And the one that really got me was one of the residents stated, you know, staff talk to us like dogs. And I was like, I, you know, no one deserves that kind of treatment or to be, to feel that way. So um, with those comments um, and without any specific resident names, um, the, uh, our volunteer ombudsman Bill, uh, you know, was armed with that information and went to the administrator of the assisted living and really showed them a clear picture of kind of what abuses were occurring. And then he was able to work with the administrator. Of course, you know, there always seems to be obstacles to correcting problems. So we were trying to help, you know, um, get over those obstacles. Uh, and uh, we helped with a plan to resolve the issues. Uh, we also referred to uh, the regulatory agency, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, since uh, it seemed to be happening to so many residents at the facility. And we uh, also um, helped residents reach out to Adult Protective Services to tell them uh, their story firsthand so that we had multiple partners in there. It wasn't just us um, uh, doing our role, but we, we, got a, we got the whole community involved. So um, with our intervention, uh, you know, residents felt that someone was listening to them and, and that things would change and they, they were happy with that. So after um, Bill did several follow-ups and the Agency for Healthcare Administration also went out, um, one of the supervisors at the, at, the, uh, at the facility was let go and, um, and it seemed that staff attitudes were, were improving. And so when, our, uh, when Bill did the follow-ups, the, uh, the residents were so happy that things had finally changed, that there was a change occurring. And they, they could feel the difference in the staff attitudes and the improvements. So um, Bill was able to close that out as resolved. And all those residents knew that they could reach out to us again but they knew, you know, they were empowered with that information and empowered to speak up in the future. So uh, I call that a success story for us. Um, so I'm hoping that um, this information has provided you uh, with another tool for your toolbox uh, to prevent uh, abuse and address abuse. And uh, I want to remind you that each of us needs to be aware and speak up when we uh, suspect abuse. Uh, but even more important, uh, we all need to stay connected and be involved in the lives of others, especially those most vulnerable people out there, so we can prevent abuse. 
Um, I also want to put a little plug out there for our volunteers. If you want to be part of this, uh, you know, involvement and in, uh, speaking up for uh, residents in long-term care, um, you can always become a volunteer ombudsman. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, so to contact the Florida's Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program for information or to make a complaint on behalf of residents or uh, just a general inquiry, or to ask about volunteering, uh, please give us a call at our toll-free number, which is 888-831-0404, or you can reach our uh, website at ombudsman.myflorida.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lynn. Great information. And I wanted to remind people that that information about the phone number for the ombudsman and the website, as well as the direct link to the website listing the residents' rights, uh, they're all in the chat box that you can print out, you can copy, or you can jot down. So thank you for wonderful information. I'm sure people will have questions for you. And please put those questions in the chat box. We'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. And so we want to move on to our next presenter. And our next presenter is Sergeant Kimberly Gunn. She's a crime prevention practitioner with the Highlands County Sheriff's Office. Sergeant Kimberly Gunn started with the Highlands County Sheriff's Office in 2006. She started in Uniform Road Patrol Division as a patrol deputy and later transitioned to the Tactical Anti-Crime Unit which is the crime suppression team within the Special Operations Division. She then advanced to detective in the narcotics unit and worked undercover for several years before she transferred to the criminal investigations unit. She was assigned as a major crimes detective and worked violent crimes and homicides before she promoted to the rank of sergeant. Sergeant Gunn worked a short stint on road patrol as a uh, district supervisor before she went back to the narcotics unit as a detective sergeant assigned to supervise narcotics investigations and operations. In 2018, the community-oriented uh, policing unit was established, uh, wherein Sergeant Gunn helped create and lead the unit. Sergeant Gunn is now assigned to the Crime Prevention Unit. She deals in public relations and crime prevention-related efforts in the community. Thank you for being with us today, Sergeant Gunn. Hi, thank you guys. Um, making sure I'm I'm on here. I'm not too familiar with Zoom. I'm normally doing these uh, in person, but Jennifer really touched on a lot of what I'm going to touch on. So it, it might sound a little redundant. I apologize for that. She had some great information. So uh, the information I'm going to put out is kind of similar to, to what she's saying. But obviously scams and frauds are a huge thing in, uh, globally across our nation. But there's three major main elements of a scam that we try to, to pump out and make people aware and that is if it's too good to be true it probably is and like i tell people guys you didn't win a mercedes um, that you didn't enter into this lottery for uh, or you didn't win all this money from publisher's clearinghouse if you didn't enter publisher's clearinghouse and one of the things that she touched on which was uh, we had a situation we had a lady that um, thought she had won the lottery. She had been contacted by an attorney's office out of Washington, Washington D.C. and basically told that she had won millions of dollars. However, she had to pay the IRS first before she could claim her monies. Uh, long story short, uh, at the end she realized that they probably weren't legitimate and she was getting threats from them to send more money and she had no more money to send. By the time we had intervened, we found out she had sent over $68,000 to this company, um, which was overseas, obviously not a legitimate law firm, but we couldn't get that money back. Once it's out of the country, there's, I mean, I hate to tell people there's really nothing we can do at that point, but it's very hard to prosecute those cases when they're going to other countries. So if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Another main element of a scam is the element of secrecy. This offer is for you, you can't tell anybody. Uh, why is that? Because they don't want you to tell your loved ones, hey, I want all these millions of dollars, I have to send this money because they know that if you tell someone that more than likely that person's gonna say, mm, no, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not really buying that. 
And obviously they've given that um, senior citizen or whomever that sales pitch and they are essentially coerced into doing it. But now they've told their family member, their family members talking them out of it and making them question the legitimacy of this lottery winning. The third, uh, which is what we see all the time is the element of urgency and the element of fear. Uh, a lot of our scams today seem to be fear-based where they have imposed threats. Like I get calls all the time that I have a warrant for my arrest and they're coming to get me, but they need to know my location um, and they need to verify my information. And like Jennifer had touched on it, guys, you know, if you have a warrant for your arrest, we're not going to pick up the phone and call you and say, hey, you have a warrant. Can you please run? Can you please make our, our job more difficult? No, we're going to we're going to actually show up in person and we're going to have a conversation. And unfortunately, we're going to you know resolve that warrant. Um, but we have that. We have the grandparent scam. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. We've had a lot of those type scams in particular to um, you know, individuals calling in with maybe a muffled background and saying, you know, grandma, it's me, you know, I'm in the back of a cop car, I got a DUI, can you help me out? I need some money, this, this, and this, and they're going to take me in and I've, or um, they're locked up overseas and they need bail money. And these individuals really believe that that is their grandson or daughter on the phone and they send that money over and next thing you know they're getting green dot cards or or sending you know itunes gift cards uh but it, it's it's not legitimate and you think well how how would somebody know that well jennifer again she touched on it with facebook uh these fraudsters are so sophisticated they stay up with the trends and with facebook they will um actually if depending on your setting on your facebook they can see and if you are new to facebook um and some of our you know i know our um senior citizens that i talk to they're like facebook's the devil i don't want to deal with it and then others are you know like you know it's a way for them to connect with their their loved ones and i get that but if you have a public setting or it's not set appropriately and you are clicking on maybe your granddaughter's uh graduation photo and you're like hey, granddaughter, you're my number one, congratulations, or whatever, and now she's going to trip to Mexico. And the scammer sees that she's in Mexico, and she's over there, and she's jet skiing, and she's having a good time. Meanwhile, you get a phone call saying that she's locked up in jail, and you have a, a female calling. It sounds a little bit muffled, and she's saying, Grandma, I'm locked up in Mexico. I had a little too much to drink. I wrecked the jet ski. I need your help. Can you please send me some money? And then the next thing you know, again, Grandma wants to help her favorite granddaughter, and she's sending money over. And so we tell people if, and I'm not saying that people don't get locked up in abroad because it does happen, but if you suspect that this, you know, person is not legitimate, hang up the phone. If it is legitimate, they'll call you back, but hang up the phone, give us a call or call them first. Some of these, like we say, um, some of these cell phone companies do work in Canada and Mexico and call first and make sure they're okay. But there's this element of urgency that, you know, in fear that these individuals feel that they have to do something right now and they can't hang up the phone. And again, these these scammers are so sophisticated that they make you feel that you have to act now or something bad is going to happen. So if you feel that there is someone locked up in a bra, one of your loved ones, give us a call. Let us help you. If we need to get with the embassy or the consulate to try to vet this, we will. We'll help you any way we can. But we certainly don't want you um, sending your money overseas. So phone scams, I'm going to touch on that real quick. If you don't recognize a number, let it go to voicemail. It's it's interesting because I, I teach this, but then I talk to individuals in the community that are, that are obviously our, our senior citizens. And what I've gathered for them is that particular demographic is such a trusting generation. Um, they pick up the phone, they see the number, and, and they want to believe it's legitimate on the other end. Uh, you know, back in, back in the day, if someone gave you their word, it was golden. It was it was truthful, and I, things like hitchhiking. I would have never thought to hitchhike in today's you know society. However, you know back then it was very common. And so I tried to see where they're coming from, even though it's kind of hard for me with the, with the age gap. But like I tell them, try not to be too trusting. Unfortunately, my generation is. I guess they, they tend to take more advantage of people and it's sad, but um, 
if you don't recognize the number, don't feel compelled to answer the phone. We already talked about the grandparent scam. Um, never be afraid to hang up the phone. If somebody asks you, hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Try to avoid saying yes if you can, just because they can record your voice and they can use that later down the road to open up lines of credit or things of that nature. Again, the IRS is never gonna call you um, for money and I'm not trying to make fun of the feds, but um, the IRS has to keep the post office employed guys. So they're gonna mail everything to you. The IRS isn't gonna say, hey, you owe us money. It's gonna come via the postal service, okay? Um, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. I've already said that. Never said money, already said that. Microsoft software, um, again, Jennifer touched on this as well. Uh, these scammers, they pay attention to the news, they pay attention to what's going on. And one of the ones that we had um, was, I guess Microsoft had, there was a platform or a program they were using. I can't remember what it was, if it was Microsoft 3 or 7. Uh, but they had, they had put on the news that they were discontinuing that. And if you wanted to continue to be on Microsoft, you would have to upgrade to the new platform. And so that evening after it was on the news, the very next day, we had scammers calling um you know telling people not sure if you're aware of the news microsoft is changing their platform if you don't have this by this date uh and, and of course they believed it uh, so they were getting people to buy the new microsoft program over the phone and if you pay 199 you get an unlimited you know every year update uh or a one-time 99 fee and if you get a couple people a day to do that and you have multiple scammers doing this, they're making thousands of dollars every day. So that's another thing. They, they do keep up with the trends and when we got to keep up with them. Door-to-door -door scams, whether it's sales scams or COVID scams, uh, we always tell people to answer the door, but don't open the door. And the reason for that is because sometimes you may see someone walking up the door and you don't want to answer the door. You don't want to deal with the headache. And I get that. But we also want them to know that you're home. We don't want them to take that as an opportunity to break into your home. And what I mean by that is a lot of burglaries, despite contrary belief, actually occur during the day when people are at work. Believe it or not, people don't break into your house at night for the most part because they don't want to be confronted. They might, you know, you might have an increase in car fishing and, and breaking into cars. But when it comes to breaking into homes, they want to generally do it during the day when people are at work. So what they will do is they will knock on the door, they will knock and knock, and if nobody answers, then they'll go to the back of the property and, and enter in through the back of the property. And then of course, take whatever they're going to take. We don't want that to happen to anyone, in particular to our, our, our seniors. So what we always try to suggest is that, go to the door and say, what do you want? Or can I help you? And see what they have to say. Don't open the door, talk through the door. And if you are alone or you're a widow, say, let me call or let me, you know, call my son next door. He's right next door. Let me get him to come over here real quick. Or my husband's in the shower. You'll have to come back later. But don't ever tell them you're alone or make it appear that you're alone or a widow. Um, let them know that you are home, but don't answer the door. You definitely don't want them pushing their way into your home. One of the things that we had recently was we had an individual or a group of individuals that were going around posing as part of CDC and they were doing COVID testing for water. And so they were knocking on people's doors, trying to push their way into homes to test the water so they could make sure that it wasn't testing positive for COVID. There is nothing um, that we have found and CDC has said that there is no um, evidence to support that COVID is transmissible through water. So again, that was, that's fraudulent. And why are they going into these people's houses? I don't know, uh, you know, if they're just scoping the place out. But either way, don't let strangers into your home. Uh, be aware of uh, workmen knocking on your door, offering to you con uh, contracting or trimming work. Make sure you're only dealing with licensed um, insured firms and never pay up front. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people that, you know, they, they, hire somebody and they think they're getting a good deal, then that person says, well, can I have a little bit of money up front? I have to buy the mulch material or I have to get a new blade for my mower or, you know, if they're hiring to do some kind of contracting work, I need to buy the drywall or this or that and they want half that money up front. The problem is anytime you put money up front um, and then they take that money and run, you know, we might not be able to, to um, be able to get your money back. We can try and we've got ways to do it. 
uh, or if they come in and they do a little bit of work and maybe it's not up to your standards or it's not in a contract or an agreement, then you may have a civil issue. And we have a, a special unit that deals with that. I'll touch on that a little bit later, but never give them money up front. If they're a legitimate contractor or handyman, they should have good credit with, you know, some of these, like we have, you know, these lumber places or uh, contracting firms where they should be able to get these materials and do what they need to do, unless it's something custom, like a custom piece of granite, but you know, try not to ever uh, give money up front. All right, credit card scams. I'm almost done. Uh, you know, see things that are, you know, we would think that would be basic, but unfortunately it, it gets, you know, put out there. Get, you know, never give your credit card number, never give your PIN number, uh, pretty self-explanatory. We, you want to shred any paperwork that's gonna have any of your pedigree information, you know, credit cards, stuff like that. We always encourage uh, our citizens, if they're writing a check, to make sure they fill it out completely. Don't um, write a zero in spaces, or write a zero, excuse me, in spaces or draw a line. Uh, never give out credit card information over the phone to anyone that calls you. Uh, one of the biggest things that I see all the time is emails. Uh, emails and text messages. I will actually get emails from you know, SunTrust or Wells Fargo that says, we believe your account has been compromised. Please click on this link to verify the information, verify these transactions. So I'll hover over the top where it says from SunTrust. And if you actually hover over it or click on it, it might say SunTrust 123456China. And if it says something like that, it's probably not legitimate SunTrust. It's probably, again, somebody that has made up a fictitious account and has created this page to make you think that, oh my gosh, again, urgency. Oh my gosh, somebody's hacked into my account. I need to, um, I need to go in there and I need to verify this. So you quickly put in your username and password. Well, guess what? Now they have your username and password. Same thing I got the other day. I got a text message from Wells Fargo saying, your Wells Fargo account, we suspect um, two transactions on your Wells Fargo account, please click here to verify these transactions. Well, I don't have a Wells Fargo account, so I knew that it was not legitimate, and of course I deleted it and that was the end of that, but if I had a Wells Fargo account, I may, it may create a sense of urgency, like, oh my gosh, they got me again, and I might go into it and look. So again, what we suggest is if you suspect that you uh, are, have an email or maybe your account has been compromised, whether it's PayPal, eBay, uh, one of your credit cards, you name it, actually go out and go into, if you have it in your favorites or however you do your bill pay, or just call them directly and call a number or a website that you have been to before that is trusted and log in that way and look. And that's what I do when I get stuff from PayPal that says, we believe this, this, and this. I'll go directly into my PayPal account and I see, okay, there's nothing fraudulent on there. This was not legitimate. Or scroll at, at the top, click on it, and you'll see it says something crazy. Uh, like I said, PayPal, one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, whatever. So that's just something to, to take into consideration. Some of the resources that we recommend, and I didn't have a, a pretty slideshow, but uh, resources, Identity theft hotline, I've, I've got that number, or you can go to identitytheft.gov. Uh, security, uh, social security fraud, which as mentioned earlier, we have a lot. That was one of the biggest scams going around. Again, to create panic, this is so, social security office. We are suspending your benefits. And of course, people were you know, afraid and the social security office was asking for your social security number. Well, if they're calling you, they shouldn't need that. They should have all that information in front of them, right? Uh, credit card fraud. One of the things that we recommend that we see to some of our seniors will get a bill in the mail. They'll get an application from Chase or a different credit card company or you're into collections. And then next thing you know, they're like, I don't have a Chase account or I don't have, I don't understand why I'm getting this bill. We highly, highly, highly recommend that you freeze your credit reports. There's only three credit bureaus. That's Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, as I'm sure most of you are aware. There are, I have it on here, uh, there are three numbers that you could call. And basically, all you have to do is pick up the phone, call them, lock your credit report, which means that nobody can open up any lines of credit. They can't get a credit card, they can't get a mortgage, um, they can't uh, get a car, anything like that. And some people say, 
well, that's kind of an inconvenience. Well, what if I want to go buy a car or what if I want to go buy a house? Well, how often do you buy a car? How often do you get a new home or mortgage a new home, especially our seniors? So like I tell them, I'm like, listen, I understand that it may sound like an inconvenience, but if you know you're going car shopping, like I was talking to a lady the other day, she goes, hey, I think I'm going to go car shopping. I was like, okay. Um, she's like, but I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to, I was like, okay, when you go to the bank and you fill out your paperwork, ask them, which credit bureau are you going to pull from? If they say Equifax, you get on the phone and you tell Equifax, hey, I'm at the bank, I'm getting a loan. Can you unlock this? They unlock it. You tell them to go ahead and pull your credit. They pull your credit. Okay, we got what we need. You call Equifax back and you say, lock my credit report. And then that way you don't have to worry about anyone opening up any lines of credit. And the beauty of this is I had an individual after I'd done one of these presentations, she called me, she says, oh my gosh, she goes, I'm so glad I, I did what you said. I had no idea my identity had been compromised. And um, I pulled my report and there was these lines of credit that were starting to pop up on my account. Uh, because the bills were getting paid through a P.O. box. And long story short, she actually got what prompted her to do this is she had got a uh, application in the mail from Chase saying that they were unable to open her credit card that she had requested uh, because her credit report was locked. And if she wished to proceed with the application process, she would need to unlock her credit. So of course she called Trace credit card and she said, I didn't order or I didn't open a line of credit. And like, well, we have an application you submitted online. And she's like, that wasn't me. And um, they were unable to open up that line of credit because her credit reports were locked. So that's one of the things that we recommend. The do not call registry. This is through ftc.gov. Um, I have done this. I think it works for your legitimate businesses that, you know, will pull phone numbers to call and maybe do marketing, you know, like direct TV or AT&T or whomever. Uh, but the do not call registry, which is where you register your phone number, basically saying, please don't call my number. That's not going to work for these illegitimate businesses overseas. They're still going to call you no matter what. So just be aware of that. And then we also have uh, a seniors versus crime unit. So here in Highlands, I'm not sure about Hillsburg or whatever, but our uh, Florida Attorney General's office, we are the only state in the country that has a volunteer unit called seniors versus crime. And what that means is that we have a group of individuals with a diverse background in general contracting, law enforcement, different um, financiers. And basically, if we have a senior or anybody, it's not just our seniors. It's called Seniors versus Crime because our uh, volunteers are seniors. And I did not pick the name. Um, they call them Senior Sleuths. This is something that was established decades ago prior, prior to me. Uh, but they, these, this group of seniors, they volunteer their time and they take these cases where are basically quasi-civil cases where maybe, again, the contractor, they've put money down, and maybe they're not getting service, or the, the person's just kind of stringing them along, and then they intervene and basically call and say, hey, listen, you know, we're Seniors versus Crime Unit, we're a special project with the Florida Attorney General's office, and we need to, to figure out what we can do to remedy this situation, and they're really effective. I would say 95% of the time, they, they get back you know, thousands of dollars for our seniors. Because once they hear Florida Attorney General's office, they, they tend to freak out a little bit and we, we normally seem, seem to get some compliance. So they're a great group. If you, I know here in Highlands County, we have it, um, Hillsburg, I'm, I'm not sure if Hillsburg or certain other um, counties have it. I know a lot of the counties have it. I just don't know which ones, but if you go to seniors, versus crime.com you can actually go on there and you can see um, what counties participate and if you find yourself maybe being potentially a victim um, and you want to you know not get a civil attorney involved and because obviously that can be very expensive we have again this group that can help mitigate some of that and hopefully recover some of those funds for you but um, again I appreciate your time I was trying not to go over my time, but thank you guys for having me today. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Sergeant Gunn. Lots of good information there. Please put your questions in the chat. There are a lot of things that came up in my mind as we were talking and as you were sharing. And one of the first things I thought about was my mother. And you were talking about not answering the phone, and it took me a long time to convince my mother that 
not answering the phone was not impolite. She thought the polite thing to do was always to answer the phone. And uh, it took a long time for me to encourage her to just let it go to voicemail to the answering machine at that time, or just to let it ring that it was her phone and she could do with what she wanted to with it. A couple of other themes that have come up throughout the presentations are fear of the unknown. And so many times we act because of those emotions, whether it's that fear of what may be happening to a loved one with the grandparent schemes, fear of technology when uh, companies claiming to be Microsoft are trying to access our computers, uh, fear of a lot of things with COVID-19, fear has been a dominant factor in all of the things that are going on because we just don't know. And that fear of the unknown, thinking of with your heart, uh, seniors are trusting. Seniors have money many times. So those are oftentimes the reason that, that people are victimized and people are lonely. So if you have seniors who are in your family or you have friends or neighbors or relatives, call them, check on them, Zoom with them because isolation is one of the greatest risk factors for becoming a victim of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. And I do want to remind people in the uh, state of Florida, the abuse hotline number is 1-800-96-ABUSE. It's 1-800-962-2873. And in the chat box, you will find that as well as information uh, from each of the presenters and the uh, annualcreditreport.com website where you can request a credit report once a year from each of the companies. And it will also give you those phone numbers that Sergeant Gunn was referring to. Seniorsversuscrime.com, that website is also listed in the chat box. And uh, the Highlands County Sheriff's Office non-emergency number, the Ombudsman phone number and website, as well as the fraud line uh, through the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I have a few questions, and while we're talking, there's plenty of time to put your questions in there. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask was uh, for AUSA Parisi, what happens when somebody calls the fraud line? So when someone calls the fraud line, like any good government line, there's a bunch of different um, questions to route you in the appropriate way. And so, because you don't have to, the goal of the fraud line is to not need to know what agency to call. So for instance, if you have a um, issue regarding someone with fraudulent COVID tests, it might direct you then to the FBI intake. So it will direct you, you'll call, There'll be a menu and that will say which will apply. And then when you pick one of those, you will get directed to the real person that relates to your issue. Wonderful. Now this question is for uh, Lynn Finley. Lynn, how has COVID-19 impacted your ability to work with seniors who are living in uh, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, and family care homes? Well, right now, uh, there are visitation restrictions, so um, our ombudsmen are not physically going into those um, facilities because we don't want to um, share any bugs or uh, anything like that. But we are still taking complaints and investigating them and trying to get them resolved. Uh, one of our main tools is the telephone. Uh, reaching out to uh, residents periodically just to ask how they're doing or if there's a complaint to reach out to a specific resident uh, and talk with staff. So we're able to do it uh, via telephone. We've had to be a little um, creative sometimes. Uh, you know, we can also use fax, emails to get documents. Um, and we can also uh, reach out to our, um, our uh, 
partners like the Agency for Health Administration or the Department of Health or um, protective services who may be able to um, uh, have access to the facilities now um, to, uh, to have them also partner with us if we have a, a concern. And I know we were talking about connectedness and the unknown, and that's, that's a real fear that, that we we're getting phone calls about, you know, families not being able to, you know, either talk to or having a hard time uh, getting, reaching um, their family or loved one in a, a long-term care facility and not being able to see them, you know, that, that put a big pressure on everyone, you know, the, the resident and how they feel and the family on insecurity on how, how they're being cared for. Um, so those are, those are valid concerns. Uh, you can reach out to the Ombudsman Program. We have lots of ideas on how to stay connected and if the facility or the, if the facility um, needs some encouragement or some help to, do, to dedicate some time to that, that's something that we're willing to, uh, willing to help with. Uh, and be creative about um, making sure people stay connected so nothing does go wrong or, uh, you know, we're, we're preventing any kind of, uh, of, of concerns that might uh, arise. Okay. So there's a way. It's just everyone is being a little more creative and a little more determined during this time. Definitely, definitely. And, uh, you know, as I said, we got those volunteers with all those varied backgrounds. So, you know, they come up with some really great ideas and how to, how to get things done. So. Okay. Sergeant Gunn, does your office have a uh, victim advocates unit for seniors? We actually have three units. We have a special victims unit that does um, handle senior citizens that are exploited or abused. We also have, like I had mentioned before, which is a seniors versus crime unit, which is not necessarily, they don't necessarily handle criminal investigations, but anything that would be in a civil matter that we could help them with from, you know, contractor complaints to um, identity theft, things that we can help them to lock their credit report, that unit specializes in that. And then we do have a victim's advocate that also assists with, um, you know, trauma to our seniors and children, of course. So we have three specific units that do handle our seniors. Okay, great. Um, Jennifer, the next question is for you. And uh, does your office work with uh, local police off, uh, jurisdictions or sheriff's offices? to um, prosecute cases? Certainly. It definitely takes a village in this area, like many areas. We actually have, uh, it's called the Transnational Elder Fraud Strike Force that was developed about a year ago. And that's because we were seeing a lot of cases go abroad and local law enforcement just doesn't have the resources um, or legal ability to go after people outside the United States and in many cases outside their county. So the goal is to be able to investigate people in the United States, but also these other organizations um, abroad, these criminal organizations. And so we have local law enforcement and state law enforcement and federal law enforcement from all the counties in the Middle District of Florida really working together to do these cases. Um, a lot of times a case will come in to either my office or the federal agents that makes more sense to be referred locally. So we also try to have good connections. So if it's a Highlands County case, I can refer it to them so that it can get worked on. Great. Uh, now, one of your uh, organizations that you're part of is the Elder Justice Coordinating Council. Can you tell us a little bit more about their role? So the Elder Justice Coordinating Council is actually a national organization and it's all of the agencies that could affect seniors. So FBI, Postal, IRS, Homeland Security. I'm, I'm not going to uh, do a good job of listing everyone. But the goal is making sure that we're making all the partnerships we need to 
to investigate and prosecute these cases. And I know that those meetings, which are held a couple of times a year, a year or more, are uh, broadcast on uh, their live stream so that even if you're not in Washington, uh, you can, as a citizen, watch those meetings and learn a great deal about what's going on. I watched one the other day, their last one, and it was very informative. I believe there are 14 or 15 uh, organizations that are part of that now, and it's everyone working together. For sure. Um, there's a question in our chat box that says, uh, who should be contacted if you feel someone is being exploited, but when it's reported, it has been determined because the elder is competent, they do not meet criteria for further investigation. Um, I'll take that one. So uh, I would encourage you to report any time that you are concerned about an individual being exploited. There are criteria that Adult Protective Services um, has to, to follow when that. And although somebody is using their money or somebody is having access to that person's money that we may not agree with, if that person is competent, they have the right to do what they want to with that money. Even though we might not like it as a family member or a loved one or a concerned person. However, I would encourage you, if you continue to be concerned about the situation, to continue to report it at 1-800-96-ABUSE, and this 1-800-962-2873, and that number's in the chat box. Because often what happens is competency over time can diminish. And if other things begin to happen as well, then it may then rise to the level where somebody needs to investigate or will investigate. And I know on the call today, there are several um, representatives from Adult Protective Services. So I would encourage them to jump in on the chat if, if there are other things that they would suggest. Uh, but yes, weighing the right of somebody to do what they want to with their money or their life and weighing our concern for their well-being or their uh, financial well-being, that's a fine line. And I would uh, just encourage you to go ahead and report it. I also would encourage you if you think somebody needs legal assistance on a civil matter, there is the Senior Legal Helpline that is available to you. And I will put that, um, that number in the chat as well. And they do help civil matters. I encourage you to go to our Facebook page and there uh, is a video by someone from Senior Legal Helpline that we did in our countdown that could talk a little bit more about Senior Legal Helpline and the information that is provided and assistance that can be provided through there. Sergeant Gunn, can you give us an example of the most common fraud right now in Highlands County? We have uh, Lynn, who is with the state of Florida. We have AUSA Parisi, who is at the federal level, but at the local level in Highlands County. What is the most common scam or fraud that you are seeing right now? <clears throat> well, COVID is, is I, again, it's it's the most current, it's the most relevant, Every it's fear-based. One of the things, the biggest scam I think that we're seeing right now is, and again, Jennifer touched on it, is, is Facebook. They are taking their friend's identity and they are sending their friend a message saying, hey, um, I just found this through a COVID relief program. It's for teachers and nurses. Um, they're looking to help uh, give monies to help pay for utilities and it's a grant it's for utilities or to get housing 
or, or whatnot, and all you have to do is pay the $500 application fee, and then you're eligible to receive these thousands of dollars towards a, a down payment on a house, and they think, they, they see the message, they see it's their friend's picture, and they don't actually click on it to see that it's going to you know, a fictitious Facebook account. It's just a duplicate Facebook account. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've even had my identity compromised where they've taken my, my profile picture and they've created accounts with me. And um, unfortunately, romance scam <laughs> was one of them. And I was like, oh my gosh. But, um, you know, and, and just to touch too on what you had said about the um, determining someone's competency, you know, and again, I feel like Jennifer said a lot of she kind of took a lot of the things I was going to say, but uh, the romance scam, sometimes it is fraudulent and sometimes there is, you know, uh, Igor on the other side and it's it's not, or, or Shrek, excuse me, Shrek on the other side and it's really not a real person. Um, and then sometimes you do have a lonely, isolated senior that doesn't have the means to, to go out, but maybe has met a young girl online and they do have some kind of relationship and maybe he decides to, I'm not trying to be funny, but be her sugar daddy. And he's willing to pay for her to, you know, get these shoes and, and get this nice dress or maybe finance her car. And, you know, I know that grandchildren will come in and they will be upset because, well, she's spending my inheritance. Well, when we sit down and we have a conversation with the person and if they are deemed competent and they're telling me, well, my grandchildren don't pay me any attention and this woman makes me feel good and she pays attention to me and it doesn't matter that there's a 30 or a 50 year age difference. We can't mm -hmm. tell someone how to spend their money and if there's nothing illegal about it and she's not coercing him and, and they, have, they have a relationship, so to speak, um, and he is deemed competent, then it may be we all obviously believe it, it's, it's exploitation, but um, we can't tell someone how to spend their money. So uh, there, is a, there is a fine line with the romance scam. Yes, that does happen more so than the, the sugar daddy scam uh, or the, the um, relationship, so to speak. But um, I would say COVID right now is, is the biggest thing. And the phones, the phones are ridiculous. The, the robo calls are ridiculous. That's, you know, pretty much what we get a lot of and you know a lot of calls of a fear from that so thank you um the senior legal helpline number in florida is 1-888-895-7873 and i put that number in the chat as well uh, lynn if some or uh, someone in a skilled nursing facility or assisted living facility were to call the ombudsman's office with a complaint what is that process? What is the normal process that they would experience? Uh, so usually, um, as you said, people would contact us via telephone is the most popular because our poster and our ombudsman visit the facilities and, and hand out information. So when someone contact, uh, contacts us, um, you know, we ask what the concern is. Um, and, uh, you know, first, I, I guess I try to educate them, you know, of their rights and empower them to, you know, uh, self-advocate if that's at all possible because when you educate and, and someone can self-advocate for themselves uh, then they can do that for their lifetime um, but uh, usually what we'll do is we'll uh, you know get you know where where are they where is the the issue happening uh, what their name is if they feel comfortable giving it to us um, and what the issues are and as I said usually that's a that's a, a conversation they're telling me a story they've they've had multiple issues or it's built up mm -hmm. to that, that, that they want to tell the story. So we listen to that story and then, um, you know, kind of uh, pick out, you know, the, the points that, you know, here we can help you with this or this, or have you tried this or this. So uh, we'll take a complaint and uh, you, uh, we have our deadline to go out to the facility under normal circumstances um, is, uh, is 10 days. Uh, so we are not an emergency service. That's more for you know, law enforcement or adult mm -hmm services but we let them know that up front and if the availability is possible we, we do get them opened more quickly but our uh, main goal is to make that face-to-face um, -face contact or, or whatever kind of contact we need to make right now uh, with the resident since that's who we work for so if anybody else calls us like family friend another um, you know staff person calls us we're trying to make that contact directly with the resident uh, within those uh, within those 10 days 
um, to see if they have that issue and um, and if they want our assistance. Of course, we're not gonna, we don't wanna force our help onto someone. So we'll, you know, um, make sure that they want our help and how they want our help. Uh, you know, they want us to do this, but they don't want us to do that. You know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And we ask them what what their what the outcome they want um, is. You know, if they, you know, I I want this person fired, and I want this new vendor for the food or something. I mean, we may not be able to do those specific things, but we can always come up with uh, with plans on on improving things or you know getting with what they need. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to point out that um, our our forte is uh, long term care facilities. So if the issue is happening within the facility and it's something the administration can change, that's usually our forte because that's where our uh, our rules and regulations you know they have to work with us. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can't you can't call us with other issues outside of long term care like a fraud or a scam. Um, that might not be our necessarily our forte, but we'll help. And we'll make sure you get to the resource that can that can best help you, um, especially when it comes to things like abuse. You know, physical abuse. You know, our volunteers may are not necessarily healthcare providers who would necessarily you know are not necessarily uh, focused or, or are able to look at bruises and understand them. You know, it's more for adult protective services. But we'll still go out and support that resident through that process. You know, we're listening, we understand, what can we do to help? And as I said in my presentation, um, we're not there necessarily to verify the issue. That's usually what Adult Protective Service is saying, yes, some sort of you know, abuse happened. For us, even if they can't pinpoint an abuse, what can we do to make that resident feel safe? As an advocate, that's what our goal is. Um, so I think we're uniquely suited for that. So, you know, we, we work in tandem with others. So, as I said, we'll take a complaint. We go out or make that contact uh, within the 10 days. We do follow-ups and um, to make sure that the, the resolution happens and that the resident is satisfied. Thank you, Lynn. Now, our last question is going to be for AUSA Parisi. Will you share an example of a case that you prosecuted um, on scams and frauds? Gosh, there's so many to think of, but the one that I'm thinking of um, that troubles me to some extent the most is a case involving an individual who thought that he had won the Jamaican lottery. Um, and this individual had dementia um, so he was able to remember, apparently, that he had won the Jamaican lottery, but not the requirements. And so they said, you won the Jamaican lottery, you won $1.2 million, but you have to pay $500 in taxes and fees to get the money from Jamaica through customs into the United States. And he sent 20 different times those taxes and fees because the fraudsters kept calling him and saying, hey, if you run your money, you really have to make that fee payment. You haven't made that fee payment. He remembered that he needed to make that fee payment. And he kept on making that fee payment. Well, in total, he lost north of $100,000 paying these fees for this lottery scam that he thought he was winning. Um, and his family didn't know because the fraudster said, don't tell anybody about what's going on because they might try to steal your money. And they, he thought that the fraudster was his friend. He thought that the fraudster was help, going to help him get this money. So he kept paying and the family never knew what was going on. And the fact, the way this was caught was someone at the bank because eventually the bank got suspicious and said, what's going on? And actually froze his account. So one of the there were a couple people working together but one of the fraudsters actually drove with this elderly gentleman to the bank to try to convince the bank that they should remove the hold on the account and of course the teller was like this is all very very strange because he seemed confused he didn't know what was going on um and so she said something and she's about to call law enforcement well what helped us is that the fraudster did decide to flee with the victim, but she left behind her purse 
which had her driver's license, which made her a little bit easier to locate. We don't always get that lucky, but he lost a lot of money. We got back some of that money, but definitely not all. And we're grateful for the bank employee. And we think it was by virtue of her going to an outreach like this event and knowing the kind of things to look out for. That's why we try to tell people about what to watch for. And we hope that you'll help us tell people as well. Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that story. And I think that just brings it home because we hear a lot of statistics. We hear a lot of large numbers that we of people being affected. And each one of those is a story, just like Jennifer just shared with us. And we're all out there looking for each other and looking out for each other. And I encourage you just to share this information. If you are looking for a speaker for your group, there are several individuals here who would be able to do that for you. If you are in Highlands County, uh, Sergeant Gunn is there. Uh, Lynn is available and her counterparts are available throughout the state. Senior Connection Center is available. And of course, the U.S. Attorney's Office loves to do outreach for just that situation, to help somebody know what to look out for and help save someone's life, save someone's financial situation, and save their quality of life as well. So on this World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for wearing purple. And thank you for helping us protect the most vulnerable among us. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>